The following is a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Left presents Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we want to welcome you to our program, Zola Levitt Presents. You know, the voices of the Holocaust survivors are passing from the scene. And we feel it's very important to let you know about the reality of the Holocaust mm -hmm. and also look to the hope that these people carry with them. Mm -hmm. So today on our program, we're going to hear from three survivors who were very young when they went to the concentration camps. They were between 10 and 15 years old. Mayor Stern, Ava Moses Kaur, and Noah Klieger are three of the people we interviewed, and they are uh, full of stories of the hardship and also the life that they have lived having survived. And it makes us wonder about, you know, how would you and I survive? What would we do? Would we renounce our faith? Would we give up and, and give in to the despair? Would we stand and look to the future? So today we're going to look at these things. Wow. I hope you get excited because this is not something that's sad, but this is something that needs to be remembered. Mm -hmm. Their stories are meant to inspire you, to empower you. And we begin by finding out how they were taken to Auschwitz. The Nuremberg laws against the Jews, you see already it. they come from 1935. So we knew already that we won't have a very bright future mm -hmm. under German rule in, in Europe. But most Jews could not leave Europe for very simple reason. First of all, they didn't get visas to other countries. They didn't have the money to buy a passage even to the United States mm -hmm. or to Australia or things like that. Mm -hmm. So they were stuck in Europe under the rule of the Germans. And then it became the Yellow Star. After eight o'clock, you, uh, you could not be in the streets anymore. Curfew. And you were, you were kicked out of schools and of, uh, mm -hmm. of jobs, etc., etc. We were herded in from our houses into a ghetto, yes. a specific area of the town where all the Jews were gathered. Yes. One morning we had orders to get ready and we are going to be marched into this brick factory from where we are going to be taken by train. And we got onto these cattle truck trains we were about 120 people in a cattle truck train. There was no room to move. There was no room to sit, just Standing. like sardines. Yes. And uh, the train started to move. It was the third night in the cattle car. The train stopped. We asked for water. And the answer came back in German. I was 10 years old. I instantly understood what happened. The train has crossed the border into Germany, and our Hungarian guards have been changed to German. That, of course, meant that we were not going to, Germ to Hungary to a labor camp, but we were being taken to Germany to be murdered. And my father looked out through that little window, and he saw the names of the stations and he said, children, it's no good. They're taking us to Poland. And we knew already then what's happening to the Jews in Poland. They were killing them. But we, had, we couldn't do anything about it. Everybody in our cattle car understood it. And people were praying. And eight, eight hours later, the train stopped. We again asked for water, and this time there was no answer in any language. I arrived with a transport of about 1,600 Jews, wow. men and women, French, Belgian, and Dutch, in Auschwitz, January 18, 1943. After four days, we arrived in Birkenau. And in Birkenau, we stayed the night in the trains till the light, and we heard music, so everybody was a bit relieved. Mm. 
my father actually what he said, he said his morning prayers, trying to figure out what direction was east. And many people joined in, praying to God for the last time. And then the doors opened on the wagons. Alice roused everybody out, oh. leave everything behind, don't take anything. You can only take a belt. Out, 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 out. Nobody had the slightest idea where we were. We stood there, a platform, the Germans call it Rampe. We, the ramp exists in Birkenau, in Auschwitz too. Mm. We stood there for a while, it was freezing cold, mm. terribly cold. Shoving, pushing, falling, people were grabbing at one another. Nobody, absolutely nobody understood what was going on and what that place was. We did not know that we arrived in Auschwitz. There was no welcoming committee to announce it. When we visited Auschwitz to create these shows, we felt the heaviness of what it was like. And now it's merely a museum mm -hmm. where over two million people a year go to see to make sure that this stays alive as history. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it was like for them arriving on the trains mm -hmm. for the selection where the, the unfit were immediately killed, mm -hmm. unfit and then those that could be used for forced labor mm -hmm. were sent to work themselves to death, essentially. And uh, the angel of death, mm -hmm. Joseph Mengele, the doctor in charge, was selecting twins mm -hmm. for experimentation, and that's how Ava survived. Wow. It, it was a process of dehumanizing the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Ava will tell us her story and how she and her twin sister, Miriam, were spotted by the guards. I actually turned around, looked all around to try to figure out what on earth is this place. And as I looked around, suddenly I realized that Daddy and my two older sisters were gone. No matter where I looked, I couldn't find them. They disappeared in the crowd in 10 minutes. So now we are holding on to Mother for dear life. Then a Nazi guard is coming yelling in German, twins, twins. Well, we were dressed alike, we looked alike. He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother said, is that good? The Nazi nodded yes, and my mother said yes. That moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother immediately to the right. We were pulled to the left. And I never even got to say goodbye to her. She was gone. We were pulled in one direction. We became part of a group of little girls, all twins. In our group, there were 13 sets of twins between the ages of two and 16. After roll call, we would go back to the barrack for Dr. Mengele's daily inspection. He would come in every morning with an entourage of eight people. And he would count us. He wanted to know how many guinea pigs he had today. The way Mengele detested us, we were not human beings. We were some object or subject or purpose to his experiments. In Auschwitz, the idea was how to understand diseases. And what I understand today, when I didn't die, would I have died? Mengele would have done the comparative autopsies, but I didn't die. And I believe that they didn't want to lose that experiment. And therefore, Mengele injected Miriam with something that stunted the growth of her kidneys. But I was lucky because when we arrived in Birkenau, uh, when we were forced out of, of these cattle trucks, yes. there was one fellow there who worked in the Zonderkommando who said to me, say you're 18, say you're 18. 
And I didn't know what he meant. And when I got in front of Mengele, mm. Mengele said to me, how old are you, little one? I said, 18. So I went left. Till and I'm alive. If I would have told them I was 15, I would have gone right. I was in Auschwitz III most of the time. Auschwitz III is Monowitz. It doesn't exist anymore. We had a shower every day, a cold shower, in the winter as well. And then you came back to the block. The block block is a barracks. You stood outside, naked, mm. wet. Before you went in, you got your, your ration of food. There was a, a roll call. When they counted, every block counted its people mm -hmm. together. It makes like 16,712, okay? And then it, uh, the order came, go to the commando. Commando is a working unit. Then you run to our commando. When you came back, they counted again. Mm -hmm. they, they turned us into beasts. They turned us into animals. We were not people anymore. We were animals there. Almost nobody could make six months in Auschwitz because he was not meant to make six months in Auschwitz. He was meant to, to work until more or less he was, he was already dead. And there was a transport, transports arrived every day. They needed workers. Mm. They didn't need skeletons. So one day in Auschwitz was already too much for a normal person. A week in Auschwitz, six months in Auschwitz, most didn't make it for six months. They made it for two or three months. One of the aspects of war, and certainly genocide, includes accumulating wealth taken from those you are killing. Mm. And the Jewish people were robbed of all their possessions, of their very hair, their mm. identity, their clothing, mm. their artifacts they brought with them, and even the gold in their teeth mm. was taken by the Nazis to fuel the war machine. And uh, it's hard to fathom now, but the, the idea that they uh, lost everything and yet these came through it with hope. Well, God is a God of hope, and it's our job to do the remembering and to do the recording of their testimony so this does not happen again. When we return, they will tell us how they were freed, the lessons they learned, and the vision for the future. Stay with us. The number of people with firsthand memory of the Holocaust is dwindling, but the importance of remembering this atrocity and paying tribute to both victims and survivors remains as significant as ever. We ask your help in assisting survivors with the love and support they desperately need. Your contribution to Zola Levitt Ministries will help provide assisted living for those who have suffered enough. Please earmark your contribution for Holocaust survivors. Hi, you know, a lot of things are going on in the world today, and especially in Israel, and this news needs to be told through this lens. That's what we do here at Zola Levitt Presents, and we're only able to do it because of your generous donations. And we just wanted to remind you, please keep giving as you are able, and we will keep doing what we do as well. Thank you so much. For insightful perspectives on Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. At levitt.com you can read the newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit our online store. Stay current with us on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Come with us on a tour of Israel or Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. Miles and I would love to host you in Israel. When you come to Israel, you'll see that this land is not only the land of promise, but it is the land of the patriarchs mm. where, you know, Miles, we'll go up on Shiloh, we'll do some things that normal tours don't normally do. Mm -hmm. It's a treat. We, we know that the Bible will come alive, you'll enjoy it. It will be a life-changing experience for you. It always is. Well, it's hard to imagine how these people survived and yet thrive to have a vision for the future. So let's go now and hear from them how they survived the camps and how they were liberated from the various camps in which they wound up. Let's go there now. So the survival came instinctively. 
and all the ideas that I had came instinctively to survive. So I never let any doubt or fear enter in my mind either. I had almost like an image, and I have no idea how that developed, how Miriam and I might look the day we walked out of this camp alive. And that was the image of survivor, two little girls holding hands, walking out of this camp alive. It was almost that the way they filmed it. But the filming, I had nothing to do with it. We left Yavozno, the concentration camp where I was, in the evening of January the 17th. And all we were given is a blanket. It was winter, very cold, and we started this march towards Germany. And how old were you at the time? I was at that time 15 years old. How I had the strength, I don't know. I was so ill, I couldn't breathe. I had pain in my ribs. But I hung on because I wanted, I could not believe that I'll die. But when we arrived in Blechhammer, I was completely out of breath. And we stayed there for five days and nights. The fifth night, uh, the, the, suddenly the doors opened and the Russians came in and I jumped on this Russian guy. He didn't know who we were and I started kissing him and they kept saying, put your hands up, put your hands up. Mm. And all, all of us were taken out and we walked with these Russians with, a, with our hands up yes. till a little river. And there was this big Russian officer and I went up to him and I says, Tovarosh, I am a Jew, yes. and I showed them my number on my arm, mm. and he started speaking to me in Yiddish. Huh. And he said to the Russian soldiers, let them all go. And he said to me, Patsan, little one, go and take whatever you want. Everything is yours. Oh my. But I couldn't eat anything because I had blisters in my mouth. Oh my. I just couldn't swallow anything. But I was free and I was happy. And I stood in the queue. They were giving the, the Russian soldiers soup. Mm. So I queued up and come, come little one, come. He didn't know who I was, but I, I didn't have my stripe clothes anymore yes. because I put on this big coat, which was big enough for two people. Yes. And I got soup and I was taking the soup and, mm. and, 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 and I was free. They tried to hold back the Soviet army with trenches, with wire, with everything. So we had to work again. And most of us died working there the two weeks. Mm. And one day they decided to evacuate the camp, not to free the camp. On April 26, they decided to evacuate the camp. They left and they wanted to take us with them. And then I decided this is the end. You're not going on any march anymore. You'll die here. And as the grenades were already coming nearer and near the red grenades, uh, grenade fire from, uh, from, the Soviet, uh, from the Soviet army, it was already in the camp. They were afraid. They left us there. They closed the gate and off they went. So we sat there and we were afraid to move. We were 60 or 70. We were afraid to approach, of course, the wire. We are afraid to approach the gate. Maybe they mined the gate. It blows up. So we didn't do anything. We sat there, and the next day it was quiet. No fire anymore, no grenades, no nothing. And the day after this, and we were still afraid. We didn't know what to do. The day after this, we heard tanks coming nearer. The gate came out, the way the gate went open, three officers came into the gate. We were sitting like 50, 60 meters. We didn't know were they SS or were they Soviet officers because we were not sure. We were too far away. And they came in and from far, the one of them yelled in German. Exactly the German, the Russian, today when you imitate the Russian, who speaks German, exactly the same German he, speak, he spoke at that so time. you knew they were Russian. He said, he said, comrades, 
we are the, we are the Red Army. Mm -hmm. You're free. Mm. So uh, the Soviets freed me. Eva, Mayer, and Noah all survived and made their way to Israel. Mayer and Noah still live there today. We right. interviewed them there. Ava has lived there, she lived in Israel for a while and now she lives in Indiana. They are all educating mm. people about what their experience was. That's why it was such a, an honor for us to have them on our wow. program. And Miles, we have a dear friend at home with us. Yes. Her name is Sonia and we are so treasured by having her in our lives. And I know that each one of these survivors have a message for the next generation. So let's continue to listen to what they have to say and grow. I want the Jewish people to survive. Yes. They've survived 2,000 years in diaspora. Yes. They should survive another 2,000 years. Why not? In Israel, but in a Jewish country. Yes. Because we cannot survive in no Jewish country. Yes. We are losing two, 300,000 people every year mm. because of mixed marriages. Yes. And it's only normal. Yes. I want the Jewish people to exist. Yes. Because the Jewish people has done a lot for the world. That's true. We have done more to the world than the world will ever do to us. Mm -hmm. And the world hates us. Mm. How is this possible? Today, I don't really care what the perpetrators think. I really it became more about me that I had power over my life, power to forgive, that killed me, liberated me, and most important part, that I immediately appreciated what the fact that I had power over my life. No one could do something to me without me having power about what happens. That was the discovery that I didn't realize that I had. I did not have any power, nor does any survivor, to change what happened. Oh, the only thing I can change is in the way I react to it. And that is up to me. And by doing so, I removed the burden that the Nazis put over my head. My granddaughter, uh, Leora, said to me, Grandpa, how can you still believe in God as a Jew after what you went through? Mm. Even though I suffered so much, mm. I am proud of the fact that I was born a Jew mm -hmm. and I suffered because of I am a Jew mm. and I'm not going to change now mm. and I'll stay a Jew and I'm very proud of our heritage mm -hmm. and what we have done and what we have created. Yes. And my desire is to be a Jew. So you were how old when you came to, to Israel? I came to Israel after the Six Day War. I was 35 years old wow. because my dream was all the time with me. My mother was here and I was so happy when the State of Israel was established. Yes. Because from England at the time of the war, yes. some of the boys did come and fought here and stayed here. Yes. But I couldn't go because they had my records and I wasn't fit enough to come to. But I stayed in England, but then got married had lovely children, two children, a, a, a daughter and a son. And I said to my wife, let's go. So I, I left everything. I had a business. I had a house. And we decided we're going to try and live in Israel. And when we arrived in Israel with a beautiful sunshine and a lot of lovely people, they were welcoming us. And this is how we came to Israel. And I'm the happiest person today <laughs> living in my own country. And you've fulfilled your dream of building your own home here. I did build my own home because I always wanted to contribute physically to my country. But unfortunately, a lot was already done. We, we build a country which is blossoming, yes. and it's not a desert anymore. That's right. And that was already done before me, unfortunately. <laughs> but I still managed to build my own house, and I think that was my contribution. So Israel is the future for the Jewish people. Without any doubt. There is no future to the Jewish people Without outside Israel. Israel, because like I said, the big countries like the United States, this will take three or four generations or mm -hmm. five generations. Yes. The others like Denmark or Belgium, it will take two generations. Yes. 
There is no future for the Jewish, for the Jewish nation if it's not Israel. What a profound word from Noah, the future is Israel. Mm. That's what this program is about. It's about the future of Israel, the future of the believers, the future of the Jewish people, those grafted in, right. and the shared destiny that we have. Yeah. You know, I think about the, the profound word in Zechariah 14, verse 4, where, where it speaks about the Messiah coming on the Mount mm. of Olives. And then it's reflected in Acts when Yeshua is caught up into heaven right. and the word comes, What's up? why are you surprised? This right. same one will return in like manner. And they are on the Mount of Olives. The prophecy of Messiah, the fulfillment in Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see more and more how the Bible is being uh, made alive and being fulfilled during our time. And the Holocaust, these horrible things that have happened mm -hmm. are to provoke us mm -hmm. to stand with the things that God is standing with. Right. There always been a remnant mm -hmm. in every generation, the people of the book. Mm -hmm. You know, there were the Cory Ten Booms, the Christians that stood with the Jewish people. But now more than ever, we need to stand. You know, there's evil plots around us all the time. Yeah. You know, you think of a Pharaoh wanting to wipe out all of the yes. babies. Yes. Or, or Herod, yes. again, all the babies. Yes. And it's a, it's a plot that's even bigger than human, than human forces. Right. It's an evil right. plot against the seed, God's yes. seed, yes. and the chosen people, the Jewish people. Yes. So it's our job to pray for them and to believe the best for them and to stand with the state and even stand with them having a military. They need to defend themselves. I think about our Orthodox Jewish friends, especially right. the modern Orthodox ones, and how they're looking for Messiah. Right. To to come for the first time. We're looking for the return of the Messiah. Right. And we've had these conversations with them that remind me of that old joke. When the Messiah comes, the general goes to the prime minister and, and the prime minister says, go and ask him, sir, is this your first visit to the Holy Land? Right. God will settle these issues. But we need to know that we are on the same side of history yeah. and we need to be working together and withstanding the forces of evil just as America and Britain and others stood against the Nazis back in the yeah. Second World War. Right. May we all find that peace. Mm. And we always like to close our program by reminding you from Psalm 122, verse 6, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit Levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Don't forget to order this week's resource by calling 1-800-WONDERS, or you can purchase it from our catalog at Levitt.com. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries.